Before we start, a few words of introduction. My name is Oliver Gindele. I'm head of machine learning at Datatonic. And in case you don't know Datatonic, just want to mention ourselves with a few words. We are a specialized consultancy doing all things data, from data engineering, data warehousing, analytics, and machine learning. And we're a Google Cloud partner. In fact, we our Google Cloud Award winner, Partner of the Year for EMEA, is in service partner. And we support Google Cloud with their, some of the largest accounts in the UK, but also in the Nordics. In this session, I'm going to talk a bit about the difficulties for data scientists to put machine learning in models in production. And I'm going to overview, present a bit an overview on the emerging landscape of tools to address some of these issues. And then I'm going to close with a case study of one of our projects we delivered this year It actually highlights pretty straightforward and easy tool set to productionize in a machine learning pipeline. So why is it that it's so hard to put machine learning models into production? There's a few reasons to that and predominantly it's around skill set. But before we talk about that in more detail, I want to bring everyone to a shared understanding of how machine learning project evolves. So this diagram shows the view that we take at Datatonic on how we progress through a machine learning or data science project. And I'm pretty sure for those of you who work in the field, most of these steps are quite familiar. But I'm just quickly going to walk you through this. So the machine learning life cycle starts with defining the use case. And that's a ob an obvious and um, important step where you want to find out where machine learning can help drive business value. You might want to define KPIs and metrics to measure and compare it against approaches that you've already taken. The discovery phase, however, goes a bit further. After definition of a use case, you might want to start doing some data assessment and data exploration to see if you have any data assets to support a machine learning use case. And this brings us to the next phase out of these three, where you want to start building machine learning models. So now we got the use case, we got the data. It's time to think of maybe some general approaches on how to solve this with machine learning. And we then quickly move on to point number four, where it's about engineering the first features, building data pipelines, doing all these transformation needed to enable and fuel machine learning models. And typically, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you would agree with me, uh, we spend a lot of time on number four and potentially also spend a lot of time on number two. Where obviously people get very excited about these days is then building the machine learning models. That's step number five. And quickly iterating over these as well. Rarely the first approach will hit the ground. You might have to tweak model approaches. You might have to seek other formalism and algorithms. And you might have to change and adopt the model parameters. So this point number six can also be uh, quite extensive and can consume a lot of time. What's a very important step is presenting the results back. So we got some models, let's say they produce great accuracy, um, very low error, all seems well. It's crucial that this gets relayed and linked back to the business case. You want to present the results and you want to make sure that the machine learning actually drives any value for the business. So number seven is an important step and it really is usually a go or no go for what follows next. So if everything turns out to be good and well, you can think about productionization. And this is the last phase of this diagram now. We're talking about deployment, where it's these three green steps, eight, nine, and 10. And that's also where often the struggle comes from, where there's a bit of gap in skill set, 
where data scientists are quite comfortable going from one to seven, but there is different tools and different practices involved in going from eight to 10. What you need there is planning for deployment, maybe knowledge of architecture, of hardware, of infrastructure. You need to operationalize the model, maybe tuning it for the hardware, making sure the code is reliable, has logging, has the right elements of monitoring. And lastly, you need to deploy it and monitor it constantly. Monitor the code itself, monitor the robustness and reliability, but also monitor the output of the, your machine learning predictions. So eight to 10 is really the hard part for a lot of data scientists because it involves software engineering skills and DevOps skills not naturally, not coming natural to a lot of data scientists. And that also includes myself. I come from a more academic background, from physics actually. And just out of curiosity, who here in the audience is a data scientist or a machine learning expert? Yeah, that's about a third. And out of these people, who comes from a physical sciences or STEM background? Yeah, that's probably half of the data scientists here. So it's quite common um, for, the, for people from a more, let's say, engineering or physical science background to have the very sharp scientific mindset to go through the steps one to seven and deliver amazing value from machine, from machine learning perspective, but then not have the right tool at hand to finish the deployment. One way to overcome this is obviously fusing teams, interacting with resources within your company and your business that have the skill set and hand over where needed. But let's see what we actually want to solve and what we need to finish this deployment. And then we can find a way to get this and get the right tool set. So what we want from this life cycle is to be very quick, right? The deployment itself, but also the whole picture, we want to cycle through really quickly in case we need to update the models or improve it. We want some element of continuous delivery where if you make updates to your models, it can de be deployed seamlessly, and maybe even multiple versions are running at the same time. In other words, we want to ship machine learning models like we ship any other software product. And to put this maybe in one phrase, we want as much automation as possible. If you update model parameters, you don't want to manually go to 10 steps to have it reach your users and be deployed as an API you want to update your code and that's it. So what we want to do is we want to fuse the discipline of machine learning with the discipline of software engineering that's emerged to really address all these points, which is DevOps. So if you fuse DevOps with machine learning, we get what the field calls or what practitioners call MLOps. And that's how we call it data tonic. And you might find some other names with other companies for that as well. But let's break this down a little bit further and get a bit more specific what MLOps really tries to achieve and how it can help us get to deployed models. There's quite a few elements and I'm just gonna briefly highlight some of the most important ones. But bear with me, we'll get back to some of these aspects a bit later as well. It's important that MLOps delivers against orchestration, right? A uh, machine learning pipeline might have multiple steps and they all need to be delivered in potentially a sequence and triggered in certain ways. Of course, the application should be scalable. As your user base grows, your predictions might grow as well. Importantly, it's not all about productionization. I think within MLOps in these environments, you need a place to play, a sandbox to experiment and be able to do R&D. If you deploy models into APIs, they need to be robust and reliable. Data validation and validation of machine learning outputs is important. If the incoming data changes and there's data drift, you want to be aware of that. And if you're model performance degrades, likewise, you need to have a good grasp on that. So that gets us to model governance. If something goes wrong, 
and the model suddenly performs worse, you might want to roll back and revert to a previous version. So versioning of model, potentially versioning of data is important. And lastly, there's the continuous integration that you can deploy any update to whatever part of a machine learning pipeline you consider, and it's going to be deployed, deployed and improved seamlessly. One way to get this all done and have data scientists now leverage the DevOps world would be to study all that, play with it, and learn it. And that might work in some cases, but the DevOps field is vast. Right? There's many tools, Ansible, Terraform, Docker, Kubernetes, you name it. There's a whole world out there. And it might be quite overwhelming and not very effective for everyone to compress that into one mind especially if a data scientist still wants to hone their skills in statistics, business intelligence, and machine learning itself. Luckily, there's some tool sets and emerging technologies around that really try to help with this, so you don't have to study all of that, but enable data scientists do not really have to care deeply about these technologies, but to actually leverage products purposely built to tackle these ML ops problems. So this is a view of the ML ops or data science platform landscape. It's by far not exhaustive. It's just a few tools that uh, we played with, we evaluated, and are quite common in the field now. And this, some of them have quite different purposes. But interestingly, they all developed after the past few years and maybe the middle of the decade has been focused on building our very performant machine learning platforms, PyTorch, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, and moved on to actually building these out or separately building platforms to solve data science as a whole or solve MLOps. So what you see at the top right are a few end-to-end -end platforms, um, collection of tools to do the whole MLOps stack. There's MLflow, there's Kubeflow in a scalable manner, either on Hadoop or on Kubernetes, for example. TensorFlow comes with its own tool set called TensorFlow Extended to do things like model versioning, data validation, data transformations. A few of these tools, Orpheus or data version control, are quite specific and target model versioning and model governance, or data governance in, in particular. And then the bottom right quadrant are software as a service tools. They're platforms you can buy in. Incidentally, Data Robots sits right over there. And they offer also a view on the data science platform. And they're often br browser-based, so you can easily build models monitor them, run experiments, and deploy them into API services. Of course, the top is more open source technology, while the bottom services, such as also Domino Data Lab, Peltarion, Selden, they come with their own um, pricing models. And um, there is obviously a very different deployment and pricing scheme attached to these. It's worth mentioning that all the big cloud providers also offer some tool sets and specific products to address this. Might be a bit more niche, or some might be more specific. But basically, um, Machine Learning Studio, SageMaker, or AI Platform from Google Cloud, they're all tools to quickly deploy uh, pre-built machine learning models or have managed notebooks to establish new data science processes. So this is very exciting. I mean, there's a lot of new tools, and at Datatonic, we had a good chance to play with a lot of these and evaluate their aspects and combine some to um, build value for machine learning. But it's still a very new field. And it means there's some downsides to these products and solutions. And I'm going to vastly generalize here. But from our observations, some of these issues I mapped out on this slide. I think predominantly there's a bit of lack of completeness to do all of MLOps within this landscape. Um, there might be platforms offering a lot in one area, but they can't 
for example, deliver as well on certain aspects, might be monitoring or logging, for example. Stability is a big issue and continuous changes because a lot of these platforms are so new. They might be still alpha versions, just really new in the game. And the whole practice of MLOps is evolving quickly as well. So there's constant changes. So it's hard to trust these platforms and build solidly around them. With some of them, you have to completely learn a completely new API or language, which can be a bit of a hurdle to adoption. And there might also be, obviously, vendor locking, especially with the proprietary solutions. Even more so, interestingly, some don't just try to enable data scientists to do work as easy as possible and is shielding them from maybe some other software engineering practices. They still require some knowledge of Kubernetes or Spark. What we've also felt is maybe with the missing features and some of the platform aspects, the playground is very isolated. But data science and machine learning is often very experimental. So you want to break down boundaries. You want to try new things, pull in new data sources, interface with other parts of the business. And that can be quite prohibitive because the platforms, if they're browser-based or deployed in certain ways, will restrict this. This goes even further with um, the issue of data silos or data access, which these platforms don't necessarily address. And lastly, and probably most importantly, they all focus on building machine learning models. But it's one thing to have hundreds of nice machine learning models within one of these products, but it doesn't necessarily lead to business value. So that aspect is maybe hard to address for software in principle, but obviously this, this lack of connection to the business is quickly felt, where we believe often machine learning use cases need to be tailored to the business and the scenario to really unlock as much value and maybe need some input from business users as well to bring in uh, business logic, business rules, etc. So what, where does it get us now? And that's a bit our data tonic view of the year is there's amazing tools coming out and they're improving by the day. But our recommendation is check if one of these solutions ticks all your boxes. You might have your own list of requirements to what a productionized model means. And if one of these tools does that, it's amazing. Go and roll with it. If not, don't despair because there's actually a lot of other tools and products around that will allow you to build tailored custom machine learning pipelines that can be easily productionized. And it's really not that hard. And the remainder of the talk, I'm going to actually walk you through an example and some specific tools that quite simply build a productionized demo pipeline that has reusable components and performs really well and is easy to build and use because it's all serverless and it's all just code. So this is a point I want to stress. Serverless products and managed services can be very useful here because they allow you to focus on the code, on what you might know, and you don't have to worry about deployments, building robust APIs, etc. Although there might be a price consideration that comes with using these products as well. But a few things I want to just briefly mention before we dive into a use case are some products we're quite familiar with on Google Cloud side. And they tackle some of the MLOps points I highlighted before. There is, for example, Composer for managed Apache Airflow, dealing with orchestration. There's fully managed data warehouses. There's AI Platform, which scales machine learning training on TensorFlow and gives access to notebooks. Of course, there's storage. There is managed ETL in the cloud as well. So let's get real and have a look at an actual use case we've done for Lush. If you're not familiar with Lush, they're a global cosmetics retailer, mostly famous for these bath bombs you see on the right. And they built cosmetics products 
but are also on a journey to become more sustainable and environmentally friendly. What it means is in their stores, they want to get rid of a lot of the packaging and they want to get rid of as much plastics as possible. So what it means is if you walk into a store, you might see a lot of their soaps and bath bombs lined up and it's a bit familiar to what when you go grocery shopping and you just see apples and bananas without them all being single wrapped. That works well for fruit. The issue here is as a consumer and a buyer, you need a lot of information because you're interested in what's in these cosmetic art articles. You might take them in your bath, you put them on your skin, so allergens are a concern. Also, if you buy them, you take them home, you don't have any packaging, you might not know what this product is that you really like or what the price is. So they thought, can we use computer vision within an app to actually recognize products and then have users pull up the information right there in the store or at home? And when we started working with Lush, they had a prototype of this developed in Core ML of iOS, but it was just hit and miss. So they asked us, can we improve the model performance? Can we actually make this available for Android and iOS and cross-deploy this? And also build a whole production ML pipeline around that allows them to update the models without any hassle so if they have new products and they develop new products on a weekly basis, they take a few images and kick off this ML pipeline that automatically will retrain a model with including the new products and then deploy it to Android and iOS. So we have the issues of building a production pipeline, improving model performance, but we also need to consider deploying ML for mobile. And it comes with its few own issues. There is limited processing speed, reduced storage or bandwidth to download large models. Power on inference can be a struggle as well. You don't want to use that app just to realize it drained 10% of your battery. If you decide to do the inference on a web service and not on the device, there are some other issues as well though. There could be latency problems disconnections and also bandwidth. But let's have a look at the operational functionality that we actually need on an ML pipeline here. And this ties back to these wish list of ML ops tasks that I mentioned before. Clearly we're dealing with images, there needs to be some processing happening. The automation of training and evaluation is important. We want to be able to have Lush add new products very quickly and have new models deployed that can recognize them. What we want to avoid though is performance to be degraded. If some rubbish imagery comes in and it ruins the model's performance, we don't want to deploy this automatically. So there needs to be some monitoring and tracking of model performance. And with that, there also needs to be some versioning of the models in case something goes bad we want to roll back or we can pinpoint exactly what model was in action when a, pr um, a prediction wasn't quite on spot. So let's look at this pipeline in the highest level of detail or in the most top view level. We start with an image upload so the Lush product designers can just create create and take images and drop them into cloud storage. There's going to be an element of data preparation. There's going to be an element of machine learning. And finally, it's going to be on device. But let's start with the data preparation side. On the data prep side, we need to convert images to TensorFlow's preferred format, which is TF records. We can then split the images in train and evaluation set. We're going to do some data preparation all in TensorFlow, for which we'll use AI platform. And then we have the ready and prepared augmented images to do model training. The conversion to TF record is quite interesting, and it happens in a service that's Cloud Dataflow. which is 
Here we go. Uh, serverless runtime for an API called Apache Beam. So it does data processing in a distributed way. You write your Python code to do the conversion to TF records. And it's just code that you submit to this cloud service. It's fully managed. It will auto scale. And in this scenario, it will do 50,000 images in a few minutes. But this scales uh, very beautifully to, to any number of images. So after this conversion and the data augmentation, which was very important here, we actually want to do machine learning and the training of a model. Data augmentation was a crucial step here because the image recognition use case is actually not that trivial. You've seen that the, a lot of the Lush products are quite similar. A lot of them are round, similar texture, similar color. So we're not trying to recognize a car versus a chair. We're trying to recognize hundreds of products that are quite similar. Plus, they're all handmade, so they have defects. If you use them at home, they might change shape, even color. Your lighting in your bathroom at home might be quite different from the store. So it turned out that it was actually a very difficult computer vision use case to tackle. And the data preparation was important, but also the model uh, training and evaluation step that we've done here in TensorFlow has a few tricks. I'll get to that in a second. So we leverage AI platform again to do the model training. We're going to store some model evaluation metrics and then check. Is our performance still good? Yes. All right. Let's convert the model to TensorFlow Lite and version it in Google Cloud Storage again so it can be picked up and baked into Android and iOS versions. So let's talk about the model very briefly. We used mobile net versus version 2, which is quite small and performant. We used a pre-trained model trained on ImageNet, but then applied transfer learning and tuned some of the layers. We did some tweaks to the architecture to really make sure we can distinguish these very similar soaps and bath bombs well. Did a lot of R&D there, did a lot of hyperparameter tuning all in our platform. And what we got to is we improved the F1 score from the prototype model in Core ML from 45% to over 97%. So from hit and miss, we get a very good accuracy. There's also the conversion to TF Lite. TF Lite is uh, TensorFlow's format for portability to deploy to devices like Android or Edge devices. And there's a step of quantization to reduce the uh, size footprint of the model and to reduce actually the storage required and also the inference time drastically. So we ended up with a model of three and a half max. AI Platform is a great tool because it allows you to use TensorFlow, same code that would run on my laptop, but scale it out on the cloud. Uh, it's an easy to use service to attach GPUs or TPUs which we used heavily here, and to do hyperparameter tuning in a distributed way where you can spin up multiple nodes without managing any configuration. So this was brilliant for this use case to train the model and hypertune where needed. Lastly, the evaluation uses BigQuery, ultimately scalable data warehouse, where for each model training run, we'll just drop one row. And you see this as an example here, we got a run ID, when it's been run and trained, number of classes. This went up to 500 now. Um, cut off, apologies, but there's metrics like accuracy, F1, etc. And it, if we think the model has good enough quality and is above a threshold, we'll actually set this serving flag to true and we can convert it to TF Lite and deploy it. So let's put this all together. We've seen the data prep stage, leveraging Dataflow and AI platform. It goes into machine learning stage, leveraging AI platform serverless again and BigQuery. And what we'll end up with is a TensorFlow Lite model in Google Cloud Storage that's versioned. Last piece of the puzzle here is this top automation component. That's Apache Airflow. So every step here is actually a task defined in Python in Airflow. And Airflow will orchestrate this. 
or the managed service Composer will orchestrate this for us. And it will scan the incoming images. So every time Lush will add a new product, they will drop a few images. If it has enough images and we set a threshold, it will kickstart this whole pipeline. And it will go through all these steps and only move on to the next step if the previous one succeeds. And if there's any failure or issue, it will shoot an email and raise this. And it does also some checks on the fly where it will, on model training, go into BigQuery, check this flag. Do we have enough accuracy? Can we serve the model? Yes. And then it will complete the last steps. So what we've seen now is we could build a very custom production pipeline completely on serverless cloud infrastructure. So it's all managed services. It's all just code. There's no configuration and management of software stack or virtual machines. We use TF Lite to make the model available on Android and iOS. And with some R&D we put in there, we got huge model improvements. So if you like Lush uh, or curious about this, Go in their store, you can download the Lush Lens app and you get their model. But on the same time, we also addressed a lot of these MLOps questions and issues that we set out to tackle today. There's the orchestration element in Composer. We got the scale of training and serving through our platform. Same with data warehousing, where we built the monitoring on. In BigQuery, governments is versioning in Google Cloud Storage. And we have actually a component of continuous integration where we connect the GitLab with Composer as well. So all these asks that we had to productionize this pipeline, they were actually met by picking the right tools of cloud products on Google Cloud. And that's what I want you to take away today. It's not that difficult to build a very unique and custom solution that delivers your use case while being quite painless to develop and even easier to use. Cloud vendors today offer a lot of great managed services, which for data scientists is a, a brilliant way to get things done without having to worry about certain aspects of software engineering. But lastly, the MLOps platforms and landscape is evolving rapidly. It's amazing. There's so many exciting developments. and. There might be still some issue around with some of these platforms, and we can't fully hearted recommend one over the other as your go-to solution. But I'm very excited about the developments that will happen, especially around Kubeflow and MLflow. And I can't wait for next year to see where these tools get to. And maybe if I give a similar talk next year, the message will be quite different. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>